today I'm going to be talking about Thomas Boleyn, father of Anne Boleyn. I was inspired to do this talk after I was interviewed on Anne Boleyn by a TV production company. I was asked how I thought Thomas Boleyn felt sitting in judgment on his daughter Queen Anne Boleyn and his son George Boleyn, Lord Rochford, in May 1536. Now, I pointed out that he didn't sit in judgment on them. He wasn't on the jury at their trials. And this caused some confusion. They were convinced he had. Now, I've been asked this before several times, and I often see comments on social media about Thomas being on the jury. But I can categorically tell you that he was not. We have the records, and his name does not appear in the list of men appointed to the jury. But let me tell you about Thomas's role in the bloody events of May 1536. Although he didn't thankfully have to give a verdict at Anne and George's trials, poor Thomas Boleyn, Earl of Wiltshire and Ormond, was forced to play a part in their fall. He was appointed to serve on the commission of Oya and Termina that tried the four men implicated in Anne's fall. Sir Henry Norris, Sir Francis Weston, William Brereton and Mark Smeaton were arraigned for high treason at Westminster Hall on the 12th of May 1536. According to the indictments drawn up by the grand juries of Middlesex and Kent, Thomas's daughter Anne, who'd been married to King Henry VIII for three years, did falsely and traitorously procure by base conversations and kisses, touchings, gifts, and other infamous incitations, these men, so that they yielded to her vile provocations. She'd seduced them with kisses, touches, and otherwise, and to have illicit intercourse with her, and had rewarded them with presents. Then she had compassed and imagined the king's death with them and her brother, and she had frequently promised to marry some one of the traitors whenever the king should depart this life, affirming she would never love the king in her heart. The dates of the alleged offences ran from early October 1533 to early January 1536. Musician Mark Smeaton, who'd been interrogated at Thomas Cromwell's own home for 24 hours, had confessed to having known the Queen carnally three times, so it was no surprise that he pleaded guilty of violation and carnal knowledge of the Queen. The other men pleaded not guilty. But they didn't have a hope of being acquitted, even with the Queen's father on the jury. And Thomas Boleyn must have known that. In cases of high treason, a plot to kill the monarch, God's anointed sovereign, a jury was meant to do their duty and find the defendant guilty. That defendant was presumed guilty, not presumed innocent, unless they proved themselves innocent. And they were often unaware of the charges against them. It's impossible to know how Thomas felt walking into Westminster Hall that day, knowing that his duty to his king would mean the brutal deaths of his children, for they weren't going to be found innocent if these men were found guilty. While Thomas would have been sympathetic to his children's cause, many other members of the commission were hostile to the men and to the Boleyns. Some owed the king or Cromwell money or favours, Others were religious conservatives and supporters of Mary. One owed William Brereton money and one was related to Jane Seymour. Thomas must have known that he couldn't do anything to help George and Anne and that he had to do his duty to the king. The commission unsurprisingly returned a verdict of guilty and the men were sentenced to a full traitor's death at Tyburn although this was later commuted to beheading on Tower Hill, thankfully. Three days later, Anne and George were tried by a jury of their peers in the King's Hall at the Tower of London. The jury was presided over by their uncle, Thomas Had, Duke of Norfolk and Lord High Steward, with his son, their cousin, Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, sitting at his feet and holding the golden staff of Earl Marshal of England. The Duke was flanked by Lord Chancellor Sir Thomas Audley and Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk. 
We know who was on the jury as we have records of the trials of Anne and George in the Bagger de Secretis and in letters and papers. The peers listed are, and I quote, Charles, Duke of Suffolk, Henry, Marquis of Exeter, William, Earl of Arundel, John, Earl of Oxford, Henry, Earl of Northumberland, Ralph, Earl of Westmoreland, Edward, Earl of Derby, Henry, Earl of Worcester, Thomas, Earl of Rutland, Robert, Earl of Sussex, George, Earl of Huntingdon, John, Lord Audley, Thomas, Lord Lawer, Henry, Lord Montague, Henry, Lord Morley, Thomas, Lord Dacre, George, Lord Cobbon, Henry, Lord Maltravers, Edward, Lord Powis, Thomas, Lord Mount Eagle, Edward, Lord Clinton, William, Lord Sandys, Andrew, Lord Windsor, Thomas, Lord Wentworth, Thomas, Lord Borough, and John, Lord Mordaunt. There is absolutely no mention of Thomas Boleyn, Earl of Wiltshire and Ormond. So where does the idea that Thomas Boleyn sat on the jury come from? Well, in a complete collection of state trials and proceedings for high treason and other crimes and misdemeanors, it quotes Gilbert Burnett, Bishop of Salisbury, writing in his 17th century work, The History of the Reformation of the Church of England, that Anne and George were brought to be tried by their peers and of whom their father, the Earl of Wiltshire, was one. However, as T.B. Howell, the editor of State Trials, points out, Burnett made a mistake, something which he himself acknowledged in an addendum to his work. In the addenda, he is quite apologetic, explaining that he thought all the records had been destroyed, so that he too easily followed the printed books in that particular. He goes on to say, but after that part of history was wrought off, I by chance met with it in another place where it was mislaid, and there I discovered the error I had committed. The Earl of Wiltshire was not one of her judges. So Burnett put his mistake right. We don't know where Thomas Boleyn was at the time of Anne and George's trial, whether he was still at court or whether he'd retreated to Hever knowing, like many before him, that there was nothing he could do to save his family. I'm often asked how Thomas could stand by and let it happen, and in this I completely agree with historian Lauren Mackay, who writes, To ask how Thomas could stand by and watch the tragic events unfold for his children is the wrong question, and we are demanding answers from the wrong person. If Henry, the most powerful man in England, divinely appointed, had made clear his desire to be rid of Thomas's children, who logically would he have complained to, and what would he have been able to achieve? Exactly. Thomas needed to think of the rest of his family. So Thomas Boleyn was definitely not on the jury that tried his son and daughter. But sadly, he was made to sit in judgment on Norris, Weston, Brereton and Smeaton. I don't think it's any surprise that both Thomas and his wife Elizabeth died within three years of their children's executions. I think the tragic events of 1536 broke them. I'm going to give you links to the other talks I've done on Thomas, so you'll be able to find those in the description. Thank you for joining me today. I do hope you enjoyed my talk. You can subscribe to the channel by clicking round about there, you can hit the bell to be notified as videos go live, and you can of course give me a like and leave me a comment. I'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>